Thank you for joining us. As Scott said, this is about the first 48 hours. I'm John Walsh, CEO of Fuse Powered. We provide a mobile monetization platform for publishers, mid to large tier publishers, that helps them maximize their IAP revenue and their ad revenue. Thank you, John. I'm Liz Priestman. I'm the EVP at Fuse. Um, little housekeeping tip. Uh, we have a ton of metrics to run through, uh, and we have 20 short minutes and five minutes of questions. So um, please do not fret about trying to copy down all the notes and all the numbers. Uh, we, were, we were more than happy to share that with you after the presentation. Just to make sure there's a, a number of Fuse folks in the room. Can you guys raise your hands? Roderick, that's you, Brian. Guys in the back. Um, if you get them your business card, we will email you out all the metrics and all the numbers so you got them handy. Um, so, why are we giving this talk today? Um, we work with a lot of publishers and developers. They work very hard to put out great games. And in the first, first 48 hours, there's usually a phone call in to us to say, okay, we're live, did you take a look at the dashboard? How are we doing? Do we have a hit on our hands? Um, is there anything you can tell me about the future of my game based on these first 48, 48 hours of metrics? So what we thought would be prudent um, is to take a deeper dive into the data we have. We've collected data on over 300 million downloads, so we have a lot of data, and try to look at those first 48 hours and uh, determine whether or not there was anything predictive we could apply to that to give an indication of how a game is going to perform over the next 60 days or so. So really that's what we are going to cover off in the talk. In terms of the methodology, we looked at a series of games um, in that first 60 days post-launch to assess um, how they performed. We looked at a variety of genres of games. Um, John's going to break them down and go through different kind of genres. The, the games vary a little bit from uh, genre to genre. And, um, and then finally, we looked at the data over 48 hours, 7 hours, 30 days, and then 60 days. And um, what we found is, you know, at the 60-day mark, it's, it's somewhat indicative of your LTV. So it was a great place for us to start um, and apply those metrics to that first 48 hours. For our presentation, uh, throw a little drama into it, we've broken this into three acts. The first one John's going to take you through, and that is the fundamental economics of the game. Thank you, Liz. Uh, so we start with the simple idea that your player value has to be greater than your player cost, of course. Player cost is about a whole bunch of things, marketing, user acquisition, lots of complicated, deep subject matter that in the course of 20 minutes, we don't really have time to cover off. Also in the first 48 hours, frankly, it's very early to tell how user acquisition and those things are going. So we're gonna focus on player value and, and drilling down into the metrics that can indicate what sort of player value you can expect after looking at the right metrics in the first 48 hours. So, and we're gonna drill specifically into relevant metrics. This is a picture of uh, the Fusebox dashboard. You can probably see here, there are a number of metrics, all of which are interesting. Uh, in that first 48 hour period, but some of which are actually predictive. And the ones we're gonna talk about today are your percentage of paying users within the first 48 hours, your average revenue per paying users uh, in the first 48 hours, and your average revenue overall for all of your users. And that's actually broken into two components, one of which is your in-app purchase revenue and the other component of which is your ad revenue. So we're gonna talk about four specific metrics. I explained what they are uh, in terms of what they mean, but uh, the four of them are, once again, in-app purchase conversions, the revenue per paying user, so how much each one of those spending players is paying, and then how much revenue you've combined from all your paying players, and finally, your ad ARP DAO, which is your average revenue per daily active user uh, from ads, and that is basically your total ad revenue divided by the number of players in your system. So the first 48 hours, as Liz said, versus 60 days, we've, uh, we've pulled out a couple of, a uh, handful of games specifically to give you actual data. Of course, they're anonymous games, but they're, they're broken down by genre. And I think one of the most insightful things about this idea of looking at metrics starting at 48 hours, then the second bar here you see is seven days, 30 days, 60 days. A lot of our publishers or publishers in general assume that your metrics are always all gonna go up after the first 48 hours. And actually that's not necessarily true. Although they, they tend to trend up, you can see that even in percentage of paying users, you can see that they, they bobble around a little bit. And in fact, in this particular case of a collectible card game, the percentage of paying users was higher after 30 days than 60. 
And when we look over at average revenue per paying user, same kind of thing. There is a general trend upwards, sometimes not as great in certain games. You can see this World Builder, for example, had an average revenue per paying user of $10 in the first 48 hours. It actually dipped over time, and after 60 days, it was back at $10, but it in fact hadn't climbed. And finally, revenue per install. Um, you can see again, there's a little bit of bumpiness with a, a general upward trend. And I think one of the other things we wanted to point out in actually showing the data is how different uh, uh, the, the genres of games can be in terms of their overall metrics. You can see that games like racing and action games typically have a lot ro lower revenue per install, uh, even over those time periods. So that's why a lot of these games end up relying on a very, very high volume of users to make a significant amount of revenue. Uh, and, and what are the end results? So after looking at all this data, and uh, Darren's in the audience, he did most of the work, so thank you for that. It's really smart. Um, you know, wh what was the end result? And when it comes to each one of these metrics, we ended up with a range that we think is pretty relevant or pretty telling around you know, what you think, what, you're, what you can expect after those 60 days. So in-app purchase conversions typically increase one and a half to two times after 60 days. Revenue per paying user typically increases it stays flat up to about 1.8 times what it was after 48 hours. In-app purchase revenue per player, which is actually a combination of those two metrics, increases by between one and a half and three and a half times at the 60 day mark. And ad revenue per daily active user, this one's interesting because the ad ARP DAO that you're seeing actually stays fairly static throughout the life of the game. And there's actually one more metric that we have to drill down into to get to how much ad revenue overall you can expect. And that ties into a con the concept of player lifespan. <clears throat> of course, in 48 hours, you don't really have a great idea of what your player lifespan is. So that's something that you can estimate. And we'll provide some benchmarks for you. But you can get some insights based on how many sessions are being played, what the duration of those sessions are, even in the first 48 hours. And we work with our partners to come up with those estimates. We separate ad revenue out. Uh, because it's, it's something that we typically find is a bit of an afterthought for our publishers. They put in ads, everybody kind of puts in ads because they recognize it's incremental revenue. And in our experience, we thought it was important to point out that ads can be a very, very material source of revenue, especially in some of those games that we saw, like action-oriented games, where we see ad revenue account for more than 50%, and in many cases, more than 70% of the revenue we actually published a game ourselves back when we were a publisher called Jaws Revenge, and more than 70% of that revenue came from ads, and that added up to more than a million dollars. So, um, anyway, back up to uh, back up to the point here. So, Act Two, we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the mediocre. So, you saw the multiples, what you can expect in terms of how those metrics grow, but what are good metrics, what are bad metrics, and what's sort of in between. And Act 3, I will reveal shortly, Liz is going to explain what we can do about those metrics. So she got the really good part. Value ranges after 48 hours. So we're going to focus on a few key metrics for each one of those revenue drivers, in-app purchases and, uh, and ad revenue. So you can see here, uh, good, bad, and mediocre. We're looking at the percentage of paying users, which ranges on the low end from half a percent up to 2.5%. Um, you can see that the average revenue per paying user, we put a low-end benchmark of $5, a high-end benchmark of $20. On the ad side, we're looking at um, player lifespan in days, again on the low-end 5 days, on the high-end 20 days lifespan. And that's the number of days the player actually engages in the game, not a, not a calendar 20 days. And then the ARP DAO, which is the revenue per daily active user from ads, on the low end of half a cent, and on the high end 3 cents. So now what we're going to do is we're going to combine those growth metrics with those actual performance metrics to get some indication of what our player value is going to look like at 60 days within that first 48 hours of launching a game. So without going through this entire slide in detail, you can get the idea here with the, with the good uh, example that 2.5% of your uh, players are paying you. We think that's going to grow by 1.5 to 2 times over the first 60 days. That's going to end up with a paying user percentage of 3.25% to 5 if the average revenue per user is $20. And that's going to grow between 1 and 1 1.8 times. You end up with an average revenue per paying user between $20 and $36. Multiply that out across the percentage of converting players. And you end up with an IAP value, in-app purchase value per player of 75 cents to $1.80. And if you, you know, take that across to bad, you're looking at 4 cents to 9 cents. 
mediocre, you're somewhere in the 23 to 54 cent range. And we use metrics, sort of quick and easy metrics of 50 cents for mediocre, a dollar for good, and you know, somewhere in the 10 cent range for we have a lot of work to do. Looking over to predicted ad revenue, you can see that we have the player lifespans across the top, 20 days with an ad arp tau of three cents. And keep in mind, that's a good metric with a good metric multiplied together, which gets you the great metric of 60 cents in player value from ads alone. Uh, and across there, you can see it could be as low as three cents from ads and in the mid range in that 15 to 20 cent range. So adding those up in that first 48 hours, you can use these metrics to get a sense of what your players are worth which is really important because you're ultimately going to go out and acquire them and that's not going to be free. So on the good side, we're looking at a player value at 60 days of somewhere around $1.35 to $2.40. On the bad side, $0.07 to $0.12. Cents. And in the mid-range, you know, like I said, in that $0.50 to $0.60 cent range, $0.38 to $0.69 cents mathematically here. So hopefully that provides you guys with some good benchmarks that you can look at and compare to your own metrics and figure out where your game lies. But ultimately, the number one question is, okay, I'm somewhere in here, hopefully you're mediocre or good. Um, what do I do now? And that's where we get the exciting Act 3 conclusion, which I'll turn over to Liz. Thank you. It won't go. Okay, so you're, you're now sitting with a lot of data. Um, and as John's pointed out, hopefully you're sitting with a great game, a good game, um, positive metrics, uh, or in the mediocre range where you've got a lot of levers at your disposal to try to massage those, those metrics and get the, your game into a better spot. If you're sitting with a bad game, it's unfortunate, but there's still lots of levers you can use to um, modify that, that, that game and put it back up into a position where you're making money. Um, but what you need is an action plan. And there's really just four levers that we've identified today that we want to take you through that you can actually do something about in terms of, of the game. Uh, the first and probably one of the most important we look at is retention. So if you have poor retention, it's really difficult to get pay players to stay in the game and actually make a purchase. So retention is critical for IAP. Retention is also critical for ads. If the players aren't there, not, they're not seeing ads, you're not going to make any ad revenue. So the number one um, uh, lever that we look to to work with is really around retention. So if the players are not there, um, Take a look first and foremost at the game loop. Is it fun enough? Is it engaging enough? Are they getting through the tutorial? We see this a lot where the metrics reveal that the players are actually getting hung up in the tutorial. They're not getting through it. That's an area to go back and work on. Um, obviously, the longer the retention is, the more potential to generate revenue. So can you move players into the heart of the game? Can you get them through that tutorial? Um, can you remind them to come back and play? Can you show them the game is alive? Are you releasing content updates? And are you telling them about it? So this is a great opportunity to use uh, push notification, in-game notifications. Let them know what you're doing with the game, how you're continually improving the game, uh, putting out new content, and keeping that, that game alive and engaging and fun for them to play. Second area we'd look at is poor IAP conversion. So, um, this is where we would drill into, are you presenting IAP in the right place? Is your IAP priced right? Are you putting the right offers in front of them to convert? Um, and does it feel like players are getting something of value? Is it the, the IEP that you're offering? Is it driving better engagement? And um, this is really an opportunity where you can put a, a compelling offer in front of them, test these offers, see what drives the best conversion, and get them engaged. Once they've made the first purchase, they're really connected with your game, they're going to stay longer, so you're solving problem two, and you're solving a retention problem. Um, and it's really important here to make them feel like that purchase has something of value, and you to communicate that value with them. The next is IEP spending. So a problem to solve is when players are not spending enough. So you may have got them to convert on a first purchase, but what now? And so are you selling the right things to the right players? And is there enough to do and enough to buy in the game? Um, we, you know, we talked with uh, one of our partners this morning is putting out a, a new title and they, uh, we really felt like they didn't have enough to buy in the game. And when they put it through the, the soft launch, what they discovered was just that, is that there wasn't enough to do in the game. And if there's not enough to do in the game, it, 
you got a fundamental problem. So you got to go back to the drawing board and make sure that you have enough for the players to spend on um, and that the pricing is right. One of the things uh, that we, we really work hard with our publishers is to identify opportunities to segment your players. And so the question we would ask, are you treating all your players the same? So if they've come into the game and they've made a purchase and they bought something for $4.99, that's fantastic. What's the next offer you're putting in front of that segment? I hope it's different than the offer you put in front of that player who converted on a $0.99 cent item or bought a bundle. So thinking about your players as, as cohorts and really segmenting um, IAP and then driving those targeted notifications to let them know that you've got something special for them. So thinking about, you know, almost like thinking about your game as a store. If John and I walked into a store, hopefully the items that they would offer John are different than the ones they would offer me. Um, and so you have to think about your players in that regard, that all players are a different profile and trying to find those opportunities to treat them uniquely. The fourth area is really ineffective ad placement. And, and it may sound counterintuitive because we, we have an ad mediation network. Um, but one of the things that we counsel our partners on is are they, they probably more often than not showing way too many ads and they're in, they're in the wrong place and they're not at the right time, they're not natural breaks in the game. Um, so thinking about your game and the overall player experience and how ads fit into that, into that game. So getting the ads in the right place at the right time. And also thinking about opportunities to, again, segment around the player behavior. So if you have you know, your so-called whales and dolphins and players that are spending a lot in your game, you may harness those ads and decide not to show those players' ads at all and keep them more engaged around the IEP conversion. Where if you have players that have maybe got to level seven and you've put three different offers in front of them to try to convert on IAP, this might be the first day they've ever played the game. If you're waiting to sh not show ads for 14 days, you may have lost half your player base. But thinking about cohorting or segmenting around player behavior and deciding to show ads once they have, um, n you know, they have not converted yet based on showing them multiple offers, that's a great time to turn ads on. So just thinking about it a little bit differently. The other area we encourage our partners to think about is, you know, we, you know we're in the US, your game, the player base might be US centric, half your players could be from North America. How are you filling ads to the rest of the players worldwide? Are your networks reaching those types of players, particularly in countries with low IP conversion? Do you have a network uh, or a partner in there that is you know, specializing in those different geographies to serve ads that are relevant to those players? And really thinking about if you're generating revenue on um, ads, they have to work. They have to be relevant, and they have to be meaningful and, and um, fit that profile of the player. So to be thinking about ads in that regard. Um, I'm going to turn it back to John. Um, we were pretty fast, actually, so we have lots of room for questions. Um, as, as we said at the outset, like all the metrics and, and the um, data that we showed before, happy to share that, happy to hand out the presentation after, the, after our chat. And we also have the backup data, if you want to take a look at that and, and dig in a little deeper. Thank you, Liz. And you forgot about my eight-minute wrap-up. So. Oh, yeah. uh, so, you know, Liz provided four, the four key areas. I mean, at the end of the day, this is a simple business with a lot of complexity. You have to get a lot of good players in the door. You have to get them to spend money. When they do spend money, you have to try and bring them enough value to spend more money. And you also have to make sure that you, you have that supplementary ad revenue stream to be able to drive that revenue from the vast majority of your players that aren't spending. But where do you start? And so... You know, what we advise our partners is, is look at your weakest metrics first. And, and something like the metrics we provided earlier can allow you to benchmark, you know, what are my weakest metrics? And we talk about retention being the most important thing because if people aren't playing, they're certainly not paying or watching ads. But we come across a lot of games where retention is quite good. And actually converting uh, players to paying players is actually pretty good. But there's not a lot of IAPs in terms of volume of spending or amount of money spent. And in that case, you have to go back and look at things like, what are you offering to sell? And so we try and provide our partners with uh, recommendations like, you know, if you don't have $1,000 worth of things to sell in your game, you don't really have a freemium game. 
because you know a lot of those metrics are driven by that whale player, a very small percentage of your audience that drive a lot of your revenue. So look at which one of those metrics you can focus on first. And I think the other thing that, that, that we really wanted to talk about here is the fact that you know, we hear the phrase a lot now that this is a, a live ops business, and I think that's something that we can't stress enough. We have a range of publishers in our network, and some of them are very good and very diligent about sort of getting up every day and looking at these metrics and thinking about what they're going to improve today. What offer are they going to make to their players? What content are they going to add to the game? How are they going to keep the game alive and keep players engaged? And those, those publishers that do that end up realizing substantially more revenue. You know, they might have had the same metrics as another publisher in those first 48 hours, but the amount of work and type of things they focus on in the game over that next 60 days or six months or two years really makes the difference between a game that can make half a million or a million dollars and a game that can make six or seven or $10 million. So I think it's that process of continuous improvement and really working at those metrics, but having the data and insights and tools to be able to focus on the right things and measure what's working. At the end of the day, our collective job is to bring ga great games to our, pub to our players that they really enjoy. And if they enjoy them enough and you present them with good value, they'll spend money. And I think that's the same for all of us. So it's that mentality that has to drive your process all the time. You launch a game, you get your metrics in for the first 48 hours, and I think as we're all realizing, that is only the beginning. Uh, and there's a lot of work ahead, but it's really fun work if you're, if you're focusing on the right thing. So that's it for us, 19 minutes and 29 seconds. So uh, we will turn it over. 28 seconds earlier to questions. Lucky, lucky audience. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so beautiful, beautiful slides full of lots of data. I hope the audience was paying attention. If you have to give a presentation at a conference, that's the way to do it. That was uh, oh, really... Really nice. Can we see the first slide again? Uh, yeah, <laughs> sure. The one where you're throwing up the gang signs? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I love how that picture ended up being a really lovely picture of Liz and a really dumb looking one of me. But yeah. Yeah, so what, what gang are you in? Yeah. Uh, uh, east side. East side, east side. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. So, in your opinion, is there, like, you hear in this business a lot the phrase retention is everything. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, is there a keyest key performance indicator, a most key performance indicator? Uh, you mean specifically relating to retention or, or no, just no, the period? No, across the, across the board. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 think, I think retention is a very, very important one because it comes down to the simple concept of if people aren't engaged in your product, then they can't spend money, they can't watch ads. And so I think, but we look a little bit deeper and I think, um, you know, in our product, we measure set number of sessions, minutes per session, and you can tell really early on. I didn't want to get too involved in that concept, but you can see really early on how engaged your player base is. So for example, if in your first day, you look at those metrics and you say, wow, the average person played two sessions and they were two minutes long each, that's not very good. Right? If they played three and a half and they were five minutes long each, okay, people are getting into the game. But you have to map that against the game itself, right? If, you, if your tutorial is nine minutes long, you know, and you got average three minute sessions, you're in trouble, right? So I think it is about that, getting the player engaged in the game. I think we're in a, in a world where the attention span is low, people have to get into the game very intuitively, and they have to get to what Liz referred to as the heart of the game, which is what's that core game loop that's really, really fun. So I think that's the number one thing. And after that, if you have engaged players, we can figure out how to make, get them to, to buy something of value, you know? Thank you. Um, does anybody have questions for the gaming gangbangers? Question back there. We have time for one question. A lot of the metrics that you had in there were, were quite high. Uh, the ARPU, um, I was just wondering what type of games were those based off on? Was that casual or um, more um, medium core? That's a good question. Those are, those are typically sort of like, uh, you know, the world builder collectible card game types. I can tell you that some of those categories like action and racing, they typically have a much lower revenue per active user. So, so the, the, what's important in those kinds of games shifts dramatically, right? When you have a game like, you know, a very popular and great game like Temple Run, 
I mean, I remember hearing the metrics, they had seven or eight million daily active users, right? So you can get away with having a one or two cent ARP down, you're still making hundreds of thousands of dollars a day. So those types of games really do rely on a very, very high volume of players. And we gave another talk last year, we talked about like specific categories of games and what the key drivers for those games are. But you're right, I mean, uh, we've never seen a, an action game with a player value of $1.50. So, you know, we're trying to generalize for this talk, but I would say those are world, world builders and collectible card games and things like that, most typically. Let's hear it for Fuse Powered. Thank you.